All right, red men. Okay, so Panzer. It doesn't look like they are here anymore. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, asked a question about what do I believe? Well, no, I'll read it word for word. Do you believe in evolution? All right. Now, the problem with the question is, is um, are you saying that evolution is a thing in which one must believe? Meaning that there aren't enough facts to substantiate a, a working scientific theory? Or are you, um, and what do you mean by evolution? You know, are you talking about Darwin's descent of man? That through um, natural selection alone, a random selection process? Well, it's not random, but you know what I mean. Uh, that, that, that nature itself is just pure randomness and whatnot. Um, hey, consoles, welcome in. Or by evolution, are you, sp are you speaking more mildly about maybe the idea of what some have referred to as a microevolution, that there is uh, variation within a particular species? Um, okay, so since Redman has renewed the question, all right, uh, uh, what do I think about the Big Bang and then uh, Darwin? Well, here's the thing. Um, uh, Darwin wasn't the first to propose an idea that th th there is variances can occur. Um, uh, obviously, the Galapagos Islands and you know, Darwin sketches and all of that stuff, the different beaks and everything, um, that over you know, a period of time, certain characteristics can be um, minimized or uh, maximized. Right. That's probably more... There's probably uh, better terminology along those lines. Um, but yeah, Darwin wasn't the first to propose such ideas. Um, uh, even in the, uh, the field of um, epigenetics and the, the, the studies um, uh, in in uh, case studies of twins, like they have uh, identical twins, they have identical DNA, but one of them will develop an allergy and the other won't. And so they're looking at how different genes can uh, lie dormant and how they, by environmental factors, can activate. And then there's the question of uh, if the gene is active now, um, will the children of the one twin have a higher propensity for having that same um, allergy while the other one is still remains relatively dormant and will not be so pronounced among his own children. Um, and if over time, you know, that, that, you know, environmental factors of that sort can have uh, an, an impact. Um, there is absolutely no reason that I can see why anybody would deny that kind of microevolutionary thing. Uh, variations within a species, you know, like dog. You know, you have coyotes, you have wolves, you have, you know, uh, you have uh, breeds, you have all of those sorts of things. You know, do all of those dogs have a single common ancestor or, you know, do they have a, or do they have a polygenesis origin uh, that they may have sh shared various bits of DNA from very similar origins. 
and so and so so and so forth. Um, I don't think anybody like worth their salt uh, would question any of those sorts of things. So, th though I think what is generally asked when when people ask these sorts of questions is that um, there are a lot of people who still challenge what Darwin had proposed because Darwin had proposed a naturalistic explanation uh, that all of life came from a single, uh, I, I, if I remember, came from a single common origin. And in that, I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that his work was, or his, his, his own ideas was uh, down uh, along the lines of polygenism. I, I, I don't, I don't recall that being a thing. I, I, th I think there was a, a common descent, right? Common descent of man. Um, now, normal, normally questions about these sorts of things usually engender those those conflicts between two extremes. Uh, one would be a complete naturalism. The philosophical claim that um, ultimate reality consists merely of matter, motion, space, and time. And that there are, therefore we can only appeal to naturalistic mechanisms in order to account for how life came about on our planet. Right? People look at the, the so-called biological Big Bang, the, uh, the Cambrian explosion. Uh, they can uh, dig down into uh, various uh, layers and geology and the, the fossil records and you know, do, do we see all the things we expect to see? Do we do we see all the transitional forms we would expect to see? No, it's, I, I, I don't see evidence for all the things that we, 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 we that, that I would like to see. You know, if I were to um, say certain things, well, hey, Trudeau, it's Pokemon. If certain things, but that's not to say, you know, uh, could. All right, so since, uh, since I believe that God had created the universe, all right, and not to say that he never had done anything prior to that, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but at the, at the very least, uh, a Catholic priest, I forget what his name was, he actually championed the Big Bang. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of priests who are who work in the Vatican Observatory, and there's there's a lot of uh, uh, priests who uh, they specialize in certain sciences and, and they write and stuff. But uh, Lamentra, I think his name was, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong or misremembering. But um, yeah, a Catholic priest uh, uh, had uh, proposed the Big Bang and. Uh, I think he was able to make use of Einstein's theory of relativity in a way that I think kind of was the final nail in the coffin uh, for uh, Newtonian physics, for instance. Now, what's interesting is uh, from, from a Catholic perspective, seeing that uh, this realm so-called of contingency is rooted in a necessary cause um, it isn't beyond the possibility for God to have spring-loaded in the mechanics of everything so that the, the, the result of the uh, the origin of the so-called tiny dot that became the Big Bang um, Was it in and of itself designed in such a way to unfold naturally? 
with that with with little to no divine intervention for instance so somebody could propose that god was the cause of the universe but then god allowed the universe to develop kind of like a human person develops from infancy or develops from a uh, um from a zygote right into human form it's a natural process we all would agree you know uh, is natural process that doesn't require divine intervention at that point now i'm I've, i'm already assuming that the, 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 the zygote right is the moment of conception in which god puts an immaterial soul right is immediately created at the moment of conception all right but everything else after that you know we're, we're talking about uh naturalistic mechanisms that god allows things to progress as they do you know so if a child dies at eight or if somebody dies uh you know at 20 because of this that and anything else uh, th these are natural forces and god allows those things to happen unless of course there's healings and miracles and stuff and there, there's been um uh, evidences of with those things occurring Right. Um, so could God have sprung this kind of sprung loaded things on the front end kind of front loaded the, uh, the, 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 the design to unfold so you have stellar evolution right you have the evolution of the uh, of the periodic table you know uh, hydrogen and other things being cooked up in the heart of stars and forcing you know elements together and re rearranging atoms to to make up what what we have as a kind of cosmic template for the, the basic building blocks for how everything uh, is structured in the realm of contingency that the four f fundamental forces of the universe, the, uh, the stronger and weaker nuclear forces, as well as electromagnetism and uh, gravity, are such that life is possible, right? I, I don't have any problem with a, a great deal of stellar evolutions and stuff like that God spring loaded the basic building box yeah sure um, the next question though is I think relates more to how do you get from non-living material to living material does there exist a naturalistic mechanism that through random chance over a long period of time that you could get more than just an amino acid here and there like how do you go from okay an amino acid just formed somewhere to now there's DNA and, 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 and why, why there should be life at all you know um, I don't think science has answered that question. From uh, from what I have read, anyways, it's more of a well, you know, here we are, so it must have happened. But of course, they're arguing from a naturalistic, you know, philosophy already. They're already presupposing what they have not even set out to prove and don't have facts enough to prove that I know of. How, how do you get to you know really complex amino chains that could constitute a protein and even if you have that once again how do you still get to the um, yeah. yeah I mean we weren't there right now let, let's let's be empirical in our language we, we weren't there to observe it with the five senses we weren't. You know, um, and I would make a distinction 
like so somebody would ask me you know in concerning like certainty you know like th there's very little I think we can have what I would call absolute certainty and it's very difficult for me to even try to define exactly what that would uh, how we would uh, define that instead I prefer to use the language of reasonable certainty what can we have a reasonable amount of certainty concerning a, th a thing or two um, from what I have encountered in terms of um, now let's just get off the specifics for a moment what if once again God did spring load the universe even in such a way that random chance could create life and you know the, the wheels would stop spinning and it would eventually grip onto something and and then there would be a kind of progression why my maybe uh, mindless randomness is I'm anthropomorphizing but happy enough with just being what it is especially with uh, the law of entropy you know the second law of thermodynamics that you know in a well in this case in a closed system specifically that all things will tend to disorder you know that there would have to be a lot of energy a lot of resources and I don't know how many times you're gonna blow up a house of you know a, a deck of cards before it actually forms an actual house but even if you have that how does that reproduce how does it pass on you still need a pink one and a blue one you know, Carl Sagan talk about how atoms are in many solar systems and Chris I yeah yeah I've I, I've, I, I, I've I've heard that I here's my problem with that is that when you look at this the atom model all right, with a nucleus and you know it looks like a little tiny drawing of a solar system uh, and not even a drawing of a solar system is all that clean and neat right um, you know, so I, I mean did God intervene well I mean if you believe in the, the resurrection you believe in the incarnation if you believe that God spoke in the Old Testament if you believe he, he he's healed people he's raised people from the dead he's uh, delivered people with demons and uh, all this other stuff it's not as difficult for a Christian to be able to say hey you know I, I, I think God was involved a little bit in moving things along um, and people have taken different positions over time you know Did, was he involved specifically not indirectly but directly and how and when right this has always been the question okay you've conceptualized God you you've reasoned to a deity now when and where has he involved himself and how can you be reasonably certain that it's that you are correct versus alternatives uh, alternative possibilities yeah. I mean really if you look at galaxies solar systems atom models and stuff like that you're just looking at the law of attraction that things are attracted to each other and moving around each other and stuff um, not sure how one can go beyond that observation um, I guess tricky is where does the line get drawn and what animals have a soul go to heaven and what's just die it seems to me a chimpanzee and dogs have souls but Jellyfish does not it's just humans that have a soul and have in of eternal life uh, Thomas Aquinas would talk about a vegetative soul an animal soul and a rational soul so traditionally within Catholicism um, there's kind of a, a life principle so to speak you know uh, a plant grows and moves and responds and 
stuff like that. Um, but the, the animal soul has instinct, memory, things of this nature. Um, but it is referred to as a, a material soul, not an immaterial soul. So I know some people might not like to hear it for those who are really attracted to their animal of choice, you know, to hear the idea that you know, and that's not to say that God can't recreate the same animal, right? The same brain structures, the same uh, propensities towards certain people and behaviors and responses and things. I mean, if, you know, it, in the end, it just simply says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, you know? I mean, I'm pretty sure we'll know exactly what that looks like when we're there. Um, but, you know... So I don't really see a problem with the idea that a person could see an animal like the one they had before that would be just as affectionate and caring towards you or something. Now, the rational soul, the immaterial soul, that soul which is uniquely created in the image and likeness of God, this is the... God takes the dust from the earth and breathes, right? He breathes. There's something that we share, a characteristic. So we, we, can, we can be said to be created in his likeness. And the immaterial soul offers us a few things that a, a mere material soul uh, animal soul would not and that would be the immateriality part of our nature aspect of our nature that allows us to be both knower and known for instance um, so the image and likeness of God is primarily in the soul okay in the immaterial soul number one it's immaterial all right, this is something that we would then share with the immaterial of, of God, because he's immaterial. Um, and as such, there's no, there's no reason for it to decompose, break down, and die. So it just continues to exist, right? So there's, there's the immortality of the soul. Yeah. And then there's the, uh, that we have free will, that we're not merely de deterministic, Right, I, I kind of like uh, like in the idea of well, f once again in, in philosophical naturalism, the, the the person is purely material. So you would have to imagine this. So you have consciousness. You have this ability to transcend things and understand things. To have this keen intellect that that can penetrate to metaphysics and, and all of this other stuff. If the consciousness is a mere appearance of free will, an illusion, so to speak, because underneath, because the consciousness must be a mere product of chemical reactions, electrical impulses, um, physical structures, uh, uh, various compositions in such a way that it constitutes a living reality that, is, that allows us to be perceptible of the passage of time where there's continuity even if all the cells in you know, it's interesting, uh, the, the cells in the brain, um, you have, the, the, the cells that you have in your brain are the ones that, you, that, that, that you're, that you're going to have, right? Uh, money cancels free will. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. You know, so are we dealing with a kind of determinism outside of the argument of an immaterial soul? And, and do we in any kind of way cheapen our grasp of free will when we claim that there are 
naturalistic forces that, that are not simply random but directed in some way within the, the, the material brain. But still, as, a, as an epiphenomenon, our consciousness Why should it even be? So the thing is, is I think sometimes when people look at animals, like a dog or a cat or a rabbit or something like that, I think we, we're projecting our own human experience behind their eyes. And we're thinking that they're interacting with the world in the same way that we are as opposed to that they're not just reacting to memory or stimuli or instinct. They lack the intellect. So yeah, so n not only uh, do we have a will, have a will, we, we also have an intellect, right? We also have an intellect. I think probably for a lot of Christians, they don't have, you know, a very specific breakdown of how they look at animals and this, that, and everything else. And, you know, um, it's kind of nice, like, kind of like we're trying to console a child, maybe, you know, you're going to see Fifi again. Fifi. Yeah, that's that's a very funny name for that duck. On uh, no, a Shrek, right? Yeah, Fifi. It's not impossible. Mosquitoes. Well, I, I mean, are you are you proposing that I, I can actually probably have a, a fun response to that? Uh, I actually knew this guy once who I, I I don't know how he 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 came to this conclusion, but he thinks I think the devil created mosquitoes. I'm like, yeah, he doesn't have the ability to do that, you know. Um, but other than the fact that they really wouldn't exist if there wasn't some sort of niche or like they, they would like they would just die out if they served eh, I don't think serve uh, yeah I mean they're like bees in, in, in some ways right. okay so obviously I reject the notion that Satan can like Create out a whole cloth just like this particular bug because we might not like being bitten by them and we don't like hearing them buzz in our ear and we just they just get all up in our face and whatnot um, but you know I, I don't really see God just through special creation just pop hey there's a mosquito a pink one and a blue one or however they work I, I, I honestly don't know how mosquitoes work um, in general I mean the things are just designed in such a way for certain things to occur
And then I guess, uh, mos you know, mosquitoes are one of those things that can exist in this universe. And not only can they, but they do. How about that? All right, I'm going to run up real quick and I'm checking my son. If there are any other uh, active questions, uh, I'm going to start this chapter in the book. <laughs>